Okay, so um, I'll talk about fusing agents and, and qualia um, and a theory of conscious consciousness, um, conscious agents. So as you well know that there are, there are many theories of consciousness out there. I mentioned a few, global workspace, integrated information, neural molecular tubules, and uh, you know, theories in, involving um, the idea that it's an, an illusion. And in, in each of these theories, um, there is a common assumption uh, to all of these theories that space-time is fundamental. It's fundamental reality. And that particles in space-time, like you know, bosons, leptons, and quarks are fundamental parts of reality. And uh, complex assemblies of these fundamental particles lead to macroscopic objects such as brains or computers or artificial intelligences. And um, these then give rise to, if they have the right kind of complexity, the right kind of circuitry, or have some higher order of properties, they lead to consciousness or to the illusion of consciousness. Um, Panpsychists um, also, at least the, the ones I'm interested in, like uh, Philip Goff, um, they also assume that space-time is fundamental and that the um, elementary particles of the standard model of physics are fundamental. What they say is, though, that um, there's a, another reality uh, behind those particles in some sense, that, that in addition to being a lepton, the lepton has uh, you know, a fundamental unit of um, uh, experience, of, of consciousness behind it. But all of these assume that space-time is fundamental uh, and that objects in space-time, such as particles, are fundamental. Uh, but the physicists have moved on. Um, they disagree. They don't think that space-time is fundamental anymore. Uh, they, they say that space-time is doomed. Um, that, so, for example, uh, Nathan Seiberg at the Institute for Advanced uh, Study at Princeton says, I'm almost certain that space and time, uh, we, we can read it for himself. They're, they're um, notions that will be re replaced by something more sophisticated. So space and time are doomed. They're, they're not fundamental. Um, Nimar Khani Hamed also says that the very notion of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There's no such thing um, in the actual laws of physics. Um, and uh, David Gross also says that, you know, that space-time has no meaning beyond, uh, beyond the Planck scale, no operational meaning. So, so what, what the physicists are, or many physicists are saying, and there are more, more quotes I could give, but I just gave three or four of the prominent ones. What they're saying is that um, you know, space-time has been assumed to be fundamental for you know, several centuries in, in um, science uh, and in physics, but uh, recent discoveries have, have overthrown that. And so I'll, I'll just give you an, an idea about the arguments that, that they give to say that space-time is not fundamental. Um, one of them is that if you want to um, measure smaller and smaller things, um, you need to have better and better resolution. And so, for example, you might use light and to resolve smaller objects with light you need to have smaller wavelengths of light to to resolve the features of the smaller objects and that's per perfectly fine uh, quantum theory tells us that as we use uh, smaller and smaller wavelengths um, we have higher and higher energies from the essentially from the heisenberg uncertainty principle and so forth so uh, and in a world in which there's just quantum mechanics, that's perfectly fine. You, as long as you have enough energy, you can go to smaller and smaller wavelengths and resolve smaller and smaller details uh, of, uh, within space-time. But when you bring in um, gravity, uh, there's a problem. Um, mass and energy are the same thing, according to Einstein's gravity theory. And uh, as you get smaller wavelengths, you're, you're essentially putting more and more energy into a smaller region of space and therefore more mass in a smaller region of space. And at some point, the energy or mass density is so high that you create a black hole and you destroy the very object you're trying to measure. And this happens at around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters the, at the Planck scale, you know, or 10 to roughly 10 to the minus 43 seconds in, in terms of the time scale, where, where space-time ceases to have any operational meaning. It's not that there are pixels of space-time, it's that the very concept of space-time itself has no operational meaning anymore. And, and from my point of view, this um, space-time is a very shallow structure. It's just a data structure that we use, and it's not, it's not objective reality. And it falls apart very early, 10 to the minus 33 
centimeters, not say 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, just 10 to the minus 33. And the data structure has has worn out. It's, it's, it's gone beyond its youth, usefulness. So, so physicists are telling us that space-time is doomed and they're looking for something beyond. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but I just want to say that, that um, evolution by natural selection agrees with physics. So that, that space-time is not fundamental. So we've used the tools of evolutionary game theory to ask the question um, and answer the question, does natural selection favor vertical perceptions? That is perceptions in which the there you know the perception is homomorphic to some property in objective reality, and what we find in evolutionary games and 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 uh, also in in some theorems that we've proven is that vertical perceptions go extinct um, in, in and we can talk about this if people are interested later on, but uh, natural selection um, favors sensory systems that guide adaptive behavior. Period. They don't favor sensory systems that tell you the truth. They favor sensory systems that guide adaptive behavior. And, and you can prove that the, the chance that a system that guides adaptive behavior also tells you the truth is precisely zero. So, so what this means is that space-time and, and physical objects are not really, they are the forms of our perception and they are adaptive forms of perception. They allow us to get through the, through the day. So space-time and physical objects are useful perceptions that we have that let us get through the day, but they're just a, a, a in some sense, a virtual reality headset. They, 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 um, they, they let us play the game of life. They guide adaptive behavior, let us survive long enough to reproduce, but they don't show us the truth any more than a VR game is showing you the truth. Um, if you're playing Grand Theft Auto in a VR version of it, you might see a, a red Ferrari that you're, you know competing against, but there's no red Ferrari in reality. In, in this example, it would be some supercomputer that's that's running the game. There's no red Ferrari inside the supercomputer. The red Ferrari exists when you perceive it and it uh, disappears as soon as you look away. Um, you, so you you create it on the fly when you look and you delete it when when you're not looking. And that's that's um, what evolution tells us, that, that evolution shaped our sensory systems to be a headset to guide adaptive behavior to play the game of life, but not to show us the truth. So it agrees with physics. Space-time is not fundamental. Physical objects in space-time are not fundamental. And, and it also agrees with um, the, the Nobel Prize that was just given in physics uh, last December to Alan Espect and John Clauser and um, um, Zeilinger, Anton Zeilinger, for, for showing that uh, physical objects in space-time have no definite values of properties such as position, momentum, and spin when they're not observed. Uh, local realism is false. So local realism is false, which is exactly what I'm, what I'm saying. Space-time is doomed. Objects in space-time have no properties when they're not perceived. So this just got the Nobel Prize last December. And, and, and this is, you know, quantum theory is true not just of the microscopic, but of the macroscopic. So, so it's true of the macroscopic objects as well. So, um, not only is space-time doomed, um, with it, uh, physicists recognize um, reductionism is doomed. So uh, reductionism, um, here's, a, here's a quote from Nimar Khani Hamed, the entire reductionist paradigm that physics is fundamentally given by some laws and so forth, that, 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 you know, the, the smallest scales is ultimately false because of gravity. You can read his quote for yourself. So, so physicists realize that space-time is doomed and entails that um, reductionism is doomed. And you know, reductionism is the view that, you know, that fundamentally space-time is the fundamental reality and at the smallest elementary units of reality, according to the standard model, are the bosons, leptons, and quarks that are shown here. And you know, complex combinations of these bosons, leptons, and quarks lead to things like pyramidal neurons, and even more complex organizations lead to things like brains. Um, and, and then according to many you know, theories that we see in, in consciousness, ultimately these, they, they give rise to consciousness. Like, so, and that, so that whole reductionist paradigm um, is, is, just, is just dead. Um, partly because you can't get it started. The, the fu fundamental particles um, as the Nobel Prize in last December 
underlined, local realism is false for them. They're not, they have no definite values of position, momentum, and spin, and so forth when they're not observed. They're, 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 they, they don't have the capability of creating um, this reality because they themselves need to be observed to, to have their properties. So, so this leads to um, a problem in theories of consciousness that, um, that everybody knows about. It's the problem that I'll call the stipulation problem of consciousness. And, and, and Steven Pinker in, in his book, Enlightenment Now, sort of highlights it um, for one of his favorite theories. He says, but you know, the last dollop of the theory that they're subjectively um, like something uh, to be the circuitry. You know, I, I, he, I think he's talking about global workspace. He likes the global workspace. And he says that 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 idea that there is it's subjectively like something to, to, to be that circuitry may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. And and what what Pinker is 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 saying is he, he likes the global workspace theory, but there's not a single specific conscious experience that you can say um, this global workspace architecture um, must be the taste of chocolate, um, you know, or, or the sound of a of a saxophone, and it could not be the the smell of a rose. And this is this problem is true for all of the um, theories of consciousness that assume that space time is fundamental. Um, there's None of these theories, as you probably are well aware, uh, can explain any specific conscious experience, like the sound of a, of a saxophone, the, the smell of a rose, what is the integrated information or qualia um, shape, your Q shape, that, that must be the, the smell of a rose and could not be the taste of garlic? Um, or what is the um, orchestrated collapse of quantum states of microtubules that must be the taste of chocolate and could not be the, the smell of, of, you know, vanilla. So no theory, no reductionist theory, you know, no physicalist theory to date can um, give you any specific conscious experience that they say must follow from their theory. There, you know, there, there is simply nothing on the table. Um, so, and, and the problem I, I think is is not that the you know they haven't thought ha thought hard enough about it. It's simply that reductionism is doomed, and it's not possible. It's simply not possible to boot up consciousness from from physicalism because reductionism is, is plain false, and 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 physicists recognize that now. Now it's not only that reductionism is false according to the physicists, but also that quantum theory is not fundamental. And that's that's quite stunning as well. That, but as, as Nima Arkani Hamed, who's at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, points out, so there's some other structure that we're looking for, and some other way of thinking about it, interpreting it, that will let us see space, time, and quantum mechanics emerge simultaneously and joined at the hip. So the physicists have good reason to believe that space time is not fundamental, that um, that quantum theory is not fundamental, that particles in space time. Um, um, do not have local realism. They, they have no definite values of their properties when they're not observed. And so the whole foundation that's um, behind most of the theories of consciousness today um, has is gone. I mean, it, it was fine 20 years ago, but it's, it's no longer fine. Um, the last 20 years, um, that, that foundation has been erased. And theories of consciousness have yet to catch up with that. Now, the physicists have... You know, it's not just a negative thing. So far, I've just said that they're telling us space-time is doomed, particles don't have properties when they're not observed, quantum theory is not fundamental. That's all negative stuff. But it, but they, they have moved on. Um, space-time is doomed, and they're looking beyond space-time, and they found some stuff. So it's, so it's not just that, um, you know, negative. But they're they're saying space-time is doomed. Great, let's go on and find new mathematical structures beyond space-time. And one thing that they've found is um, scattering amplitudes, which are the, some of the most fundamental data that physicists use. When you, like in the Large Hadron Collider and other colliders, you, you take some particles at high velocity, smash them into each other, and look at what comes out. And the, so those are scattering processes, and the amplitudes or probabilities um, are fundamental data that control um, the development of, of the theories in physics. So... What they, you know, so you might, for example, have two gluons smash into each other and four gluons come, um, you know, spraying out, and you want to get the probability for that event. And so, what, what it, 
It turns out if you try to do, you know, this kind of thing, two gluons in, four gluons out in space time, you can write down the scattering amplitude for it. it it's several hundred pages of mathematics. Um, it's, it's, it's millions of terms or hundreds of thousands of terms, maybe millions of terms um, when you do it in space time. But what they discovered is um, if you let go of space time, um, it's this, it's trivial. So they, they've discovered that space time um, you know, it makes makes things harder than they need to be. The scattering amplitudes, when you compute them inside space time and use Feynman diagrams and so forth, are, are ex exceedingly difficult. But when you do it outside of space time with new techniques that I'll, I'll mention in a, mi in a minute, they, um, the scattering amplitude all of a sudden becomes easy to compute. The mathematics becomes easy, and you see new symmetries, something called the infinite Yangian symmetry that you can't see uh, in space time. So, and what they found is that um, these, there's this object beyond space-time called the amplitudehedron. Um, it was discovered in 2013, so this is you know only in the last 10 years. So, in fact, most most physicists are not aware of this. So, most of, of course, cognitive neuroscientists studying consciousness are, are are almost surely not aware of this. It's it's very very recent, but but space-time is dead, and there are new new structures beyond space-time like the amplitudehedron that are allowing us to do physics, compute scattering amplitudes, much more easily than, than is, is done in space-time. You, you, you get the right answers, and um, you see new symmetries that you can't see inside space-time. Now, remarkably, um, so behind the amplitudehedron, there's another structure that's even more deep that they found. It's the deepest one they found. It's called a decorated permutation. And um, I have some slides about it. We probably won't have time, but if people are interested, I can go into decorated permutations in some detail. Um, but the so the deepest structure they found is um, decorated permutations. These are so so the bottom line is space time is doomed as well as reductionism, and physicists have moved on. They're looking beyond space time, not not inside space time, but beyond space-time, they're finding structures entirely outside of space-time. The amplitudehedron, cosmological polytope, and the deepest one are these decorated permutations. So space-time is doomed. Behind space-time, physicists have found is our uh, structures entirely outside of space-time. One is the amplitudehedron, and behind that is um, the deepest is decorated permutations. Okay. But it's quite striking. Um, they have these structures beyond space-time, but no dynamics. These are just static structures that the physicists have found. So, you know, this is all the last 10 years. So, you know, give them a break. This, this is all fairly new stuff. Um, but they they found these, these static structures, like these monoliths beyond space-time, which are full of meaning, but um, it's hard to know what they really mean. We're, we're sort of like the apes in 2001, a space odyssey. <laughs> Where they see the monolith, and they're they're all they're jumping around and screaming and, and hooting and pa pounding on it, and they know it's important, but they don't know what it means. And that's that's where we are in physics right now. We found decorated permutations and amplitudehedron, and they're, they're they're these these important objects beyond space time. They they get the right answers, they make the math simpler, and they sh they they show reveal symmetries that are true, but you can't see in space time. So we know that they're important, but there's no notion of dynamics. Um, beyond space-time yet, just these static structures. So, so that's um, a little background on why I, I think physicalist, physicalist approaches to conscious consciousness <clears throat> won't work. So I'm going to propose with my, my collaborators that consciousness itself is fundamental. We have a theory that we call the theory of conscious agents. So we're not trying to boot up consciousness from physics um, because the physicists tell us not to do that. Um, Local realism is false. So we're starting with consciousness, qua consciousness, and we're going to solve this, deal with the stipulation process by, by choosing the fewest properties of consciousness to boot up a theory. So if you, if you look at all the things you'd like a theory of consciousness to do and to explain, here's a, a, a partial list, like you like to deal with qualia and perhaps free will and action, attention, learning, memory, intelligence, the self. Um, you'd like to be able to um, do a lot of things with the theory. What we're going to do with our theory of conscious agents is just pick a, a couple of these, the notion of qualia and of action. 
and and turn those into mathematical model. So in our model, um, we a conscious agent is a formal entity. It, the intuition is that it has um, a conscious agent has a, a set of conscious experiences that we call X and a set of actions that it can take uh, that we call G. And um, there's a whole network of conscious agents that we call W. And the P DNA kernels are, are literally just, um, they're Markovian kernels that are probabilistic relationships. If, you know, given that I have a certain experience uh, in X, what is the probability that I'll make a certain decision D given that I've made a decision on the, the action kernel gives the probabilities of uh, various actions that I will uh, influence the network and so forth. Um, and then the P kernel is just a perception kernel, how the network of agents affects um, the Markovian kernel sh that shows how they affect uh, my perceptions as an agent. So the, the way to think about this intuitively is like the Twitterverse. The Twitterverse is a vast network of interacting agents. And um, I have, if I'm a Twitter user, uh, I might be following a bunch of people. So when they tweet, I, 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 I perceive. So that would be the, my P kernel. Uh, the, those are the people I'm following. And, and when they tweet, I, I get a perception. When I, when I get a tweet, I make a decision. Do, do I, maybe I want to retweet it. So that's going to be my D kernel. Um, deciding whether I want to retweet or not, or, or or make my own new Twitter thing. When I do it, then I, I send it out to the network of, of the Twitter users. That's my A kernel, and they so that's the and W is that whole network of, of of Twitter users. And so this you can think about the conscious agent network is like the Twitterverse, and each uh, agent is is following and 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 being followed and tweeting and retweeting and, and making their own tweets and so forth. So that's that's the intuitive notion of a conscious agent, but all the the key thing is that the kernels, the P, D, and A kernels, those mappings are all Markovian. The whole thing is a Markovian dynamics. So W, X, and G are measurable spaces. P, D, and A are Markovian kernels, and N is an integer. But if you think Twitterverse, you'll get the right intuitions. And then the conscious realism thesis says that. Um, that consciousness is fundamental, essentially, that um, this is the fundamental reality. And, and conscious agents are the fundamental, you know, the networks of conscious agents are the fundamental reality. You can take um, two conscious agents, and if, if people are interested, we can go into the details of this. Um, but if you take two conscious agents and have them interact, um, they, um, you can in a network where you can have four conscious agents and so forth. As I mentioned, you can have any number of combinations of comp conscious agents. And when agents um, interact, they combine um, and form um, uh, new agents. Uh, so so it, it turns out that whenever you have uh, any group of agents, 10,000 or million agents, any group of them satisfy the definition of a conscious agent. So they are also a conscious agent. So agents combine. Um, and ultimately, um, so this is a monism. It's, it's saying that consciousness is fundamental. It's not a dualism. Um, well, I'll tell you where I think physics comes in. I think it comes in basic, basically as a user interface that certain conscious agents, um, use to interact with other conscious agents. So space time is not, um, a fundamental reality separate from consciousness. It's a particular, um, um, data structure in X that you know, um, the, the, the perceptual space of, of some conscious agents and, and nothing more. So a few things about these conscious agents, they're computationally universal. Anything that can be done with a Turing machine um, uh, is trivial to prove can be done with um, networks of conscious agents. So, so even though we've only started off with um, essentially perception and action and decision, as the um, the elements of our our, our uh, conscious agent, um, we can build anything that we want to. So th th we're not assuming that there's a self. We're not assuming intelligence. We're not assuming learning, memory, problem solving, any of those abilities in the fundamental definition of a conscious agent. Um, but no problem. We can build um, networks of conscious agents that um, build any structure for learning, memory, problem solving that you want. The uh, networks of conscious agents can do anything that neural networks can do. Um, but in, in fact, um, they 
they can do more. Um, they're not limited to computation because the this is a technical thing, but the the measurable sets of the Markovian uh, uh, kernels uh, are not required to be um, recursively enumerable. So, in fact, conscious agent networks are not limited to computation. They're 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 Turing universal, but they go beyond Turing. So, but we can go into that more if you want. So, it, it turns out that um, it, just in the last few months, we've discovered uh, that uh, we can. But, but, but apparently, this is a new contribution to mathematics. We we, we we were looking at this, we have these conscious agents beyond space-time. Um, we wanted to see how to boot up space-time. As I mentioned, the physicists have told us that the deepest thing that they've found are these decorated permutations beyond space-time. That's, that's the deepest structure they've found beyond space-time. So we said, okay, well, can we, um, you know, we have these conscious agents beyond space-time. We have a dynamics, a Markovian dynamics. Can we um, show that our dynamics um, gives rise to decorated permutations? If so, then we're good. We can start with the a, 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 a dynamics of conscious agents, this Twitterverse of conscious agents outside of space-time, project it down to decorated permutations, and then the physicists tell us how to take it all the way from decorated permutations into space-time and scattering amplitudes. Every single scattering amplitude can be computed now in, in this manner. So um, we just a few months ago said, okay, well, so has someone done this? Has the mathematicians um, shown how you can um, classify Markovian dynamics with um, decorated permutations. And we did a search and no one had done it. So so we did it. In, it um, we, we, it's a, apparently a new contribution to math. We, we show um, in our paper that was published in January, Fusions of Consciousness, we show precisely how to take any Markovian kernel and um, map it onto decorated permutations. And and so we we have now the map. We have a we can start with a theory of consciousness, that's um, not a reductionist theory. It's not emergent from something inside space time. It's utterly beyond space time and utterly beyond quantum theory. This theory of consciousness projects down to decorated permutations, um, math, in a mathematically precise way, and then from decorated permutations, um, we use what the physicists have already done. Um, to compute the amplitude hedron and then the scattering amplitudes inside space-time. So what we find is not that consciousness emerges from space-time, because it can't. Space-time is doomed. It's not fundamental. So any theory that tries to boot up consciousness from anything inside space-time is doomed to fail. So we do the other. We go the other way. We start with the theory of consciousness, and we show that we can boot up space-time as a trivial interface that, that some conscious agents use, but probably most use something else. I mean, space-time is not a particularly interesting interface, not, not a particularly deep one. It's just it's one that we happen to we happen to use, but it's not terribly exciting other than that. So so the idea then is that space-time emerges as 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 a fairly trivial interface, um, and, and consciousness does not emerge from space-time. So, so, so in this here we go from conscious agent networks down to decorated permutations. From the decorated permutations, you can then go and and get space time. Now the physicists tell us how how to do that. Um, so, let's see how much time I've got. Um, I'll I'll go. There, there's some technical stuff that are in the in the paper that I that I sent, you know, that I attached the, the abstract, the, the fusions of consciousness. Um, I, I don't know. I'll just mention that there's a, a nice mathematical thing that comes out of this theory um, is that when you have um, two conscious agents, what, what I've done here is um, I should go back here and just say, you know, I can take the this whole um, PDA loop here and um, make a Q kernel where I, I basically take D followed by A followed by P. Take those kernels and multiply those kernels, those matrices together into a single kernel that goes from X to X. And basically that kernel is telling me you know, for this particular agent, if it has a particular experience in X at time one, uh, what, what is the probability uh, of the various experiences it will have at time two and three and four? So that's what this Q kernel is doing. The Q kernel is the kernel P 
uh, AD, and it's a single kernel that, that basically um, gives you the sequence of experiences that a conscious agent will have. And so if I have um, a conscious agent, Q1, that only sees red. So it's a very, very simple conscious agent. It only sees red. And I have another one that only sees green. And I can put them together um, into a kernel. You, know, you can see the kernel there, um, uh, a Q kernel. And uh, that Q kernel now is a combination. So this is a, 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 a mathematically precise solution to the combination problem. We literally take um, any conscious agents that we want and take their Q kernels and we can put them into, um, uh, combine them into um, a new Markovian kernel and we get a conscious agent that sees not just red or, or green, but red and it sees both red and green. And it goes back and forth between the, the experiences of red and green. So this is a mathematically precise solution to the combination problem. And when you look at um, the the space of all possible such combination agents, so um, right, this this is there's a different um, conscious agent for each value of x and each value of y that you want to put in here. So this is not just one combination agent. This is a a two dimensional continuum of combinations of conscious agents. So that that continuum is um, that the two dimensional space is in fact um, what we call the Markov polytope M two. And, and here, here is the parameter space of that Markov polytope. Um, this, this gives you all two by two matrices, um, uh, Markovian matrices. And for each matrix, there is a distinct conscious agent that is a combination of the two simple conscious agents. And you can show um, um, the, the, there are very interesting properties of, of, of the Markov polytope M2. Um, and and if, if you have N, conscious agents, um, you can make a, a combination of N conscious agents, and that all those combinations are the Markov polytope M sub N. Um, and it is a polytope. Um, it, it's, it's an object, a geometric object with vertices. It turns out that the Markov polytope M sub N with, with, uh, for N agents has N to the N power vertices. And so it, it, the number of vertices grows exponentially. So there's a very, very rich mathematical um, area to explore all these math, um, Markov polytopes are telling you all the possibilities for conscious combinations of conscious of, of n conscious agents so it's it's it gives you a, a mathematically precise um, arena to study combinations uh, of conscious agents in and it turns out that it's it you can prove that um, for any conscious agents in the interior of the Markov polytope generically they're going to um the dynamics will eventually lead to what's called the fusion simplex there's a little diagonal here um the cross diagonal which is the fusion simplex when when the dynamics goes to that the actual uh, 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 let's see i'll show you that the well i'll go i don't want to take too much time here uh, i'll just I'll, I'll just summarize it um when they go to that diagonal they 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 the kernels actually drop rank, and the the agents are not no are no longer just combined; they're actually fused. A, a brand new agent that that's a fusion, not just a combination, but a fusion of the original agents with a new qualia. That's not just a you know I saw red and then I saw green. It's a, a brand new qualia that's a fusion. Um, um, comes out of this. So uh, now just. Here's here's the idea of it, you know, the, the fusion. You know, here's the red on the left and the green on the right, and there's the one parameter family of of, of of fusions that that come out of this, and each one has its own new quality that comes out. So, and in three dimensional space, um, you know, for for three uh, conscious agents, the the the, the fusion is um a, it is this three simplex, a, a two dimensional simplex. In general, for n agents, the fusions are an n minus one simplex. So you get an n minus one simplex. The combinations are the Markov polytope M sub n, um, which um, has um, n to the n, uh, n raised to the n power um, vertices, but the um, the fusions are an n minus one simplex. So um, I'll, I've run out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. I'll just say that the, the, the key 
connection between um, the Markov chains and the decorated permutations are something called the communicating classes of the Markov chains. So it, it, it turns out that the decorated permutations are really just um, classifying the communicating classes of the Markov chains. And so we're now using this to actually make predictions about particle physics. So the idea is that particles in space-time, the bosons, leptons, and quarks, are projections of communicating classes of conscious agents. And we can and and we now can do this projection entirely without hand wave. We can start with conscious agents, project down to decorated permutations, and then go from the decorated permutations down to the particle scattering, like gluon scattering. So so the math the, the, the projection is now mathematically well defined. And so we're looking at the the properties of conscious agent dynamics um, that that map to um, particle properties. So for example, I'll just mention one briefly. The the entropy rate of the communicating class of a conscious agent projects to what's called mass in space-time. So mass in space-time of a particle is, is simply the, um, the so-called entropy rate of the communicating class. Um, and, and that has some interesting properties. So, so in other words, what we're doing is the opposite of what basically the whole field of consciousness studies is trying to do right now. Right now, everybody in consciousness study is saying, um, we'll, we we get consciousness as as emergent from brain activity, typically, or you know, some pattern of integrated information of some uh, physical system, may, maybe beyond not just brains, but but somehow consciousness is an emergent property from things inside space time, things that are complicated enough. And what I'm saying is, physics tells us that's not possible. Space time is doomed. It's not fundamental, and the objects in space time. Um, fail to have local realism. That was the Nobel Prize. So what we're doing is the opposite. We're saying that space-time is emergent. Particles and brains are emergent, um, not consciousness. So so brains are 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 simply icons that consciousness creates on its on its space-time interface for those that use space-time. So you can see this this changes the whole game from the way it's typically played. And I'll, I think I'll I'll stop. Um, you have a couple of minutes. You started late. You have a couple of min more minutes if you want to present. Oh, okay. Slides. That's totally fine. Okay. Well, uh, now I can say got it and give. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Then um, maybe I will say a couple other things. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll just summarize this way so the conscious to, to really summarize the big picture conscious agent networks um give rise to um markov polytopes and markov polytopes give rise to decorated permutations that's that's that, a new mathematical theorem that we that we published in in january so there is this map from the agent networks of consciousness down to decorated permutations and um so physics has said you know the physicists tell us that you if they if you that behind space time is doomed, but behind space time is the amplitude heater, and that's the um, the little red jewel there. And behind the amplitude heater are the decorated permutations. And what we're saying is, okay, well, um, so space time is doomed. We're not, we're not going to waste our time with theories of consciousness that start with things in space time, like neurons or or whatever, uh, you know, microtubules and their quantum states. Things inside space time don't have what it takes to boot up consciousness because the local realism is false. So we'll start with consciousness and um, conscious agent networks lead to these Markov polytopes. That's the diamond up there on the right corner. And those Markov polytopes project down to decorated permutations. And um, the work we're doing in physics right now is we're actually showing um, that the there is a, a point of connection that's really critical where the fundamental scattering diagram, so I, the, the, those little um, hands are pointing to the two fundamental scattering diagrams in, 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 in particle physics for, for three particle amplitudes. Um, we, we show how they come from our Markov polytope, M sub three, um, and, and the decorated permutations of that. So, so, in, so this is sort of the link. So consciousness cannot emerge from space-time in any way because space-time is doomed and reductionism is doomed. It's not possible. We're wasting our time. 
But if we start with conscious agent, uh, you know, consciousness beyond space-time, it turns out it is possible to get space-time to emerge as a trivial data structure, not as fundamental reality, but as a trivial data structure that some agents use, but probably most conscious agents don't. I would imagine that that space-time is used by a measure zero set of conscious agents. We just happen to be some who use that. So, so we have now this bridge between consciousness um, and space-time, and now it's time to populate that bridge. We're looking at the basics of these Markov polytopes, the, how they lead to the differential forms, and various properties of particles in space-time, the helicities, energy momentum, the masses, and so forth. We and we are, you know, in the paper we're we're working on right now, we're gonna we we have um theories for the energy and momentum. Um I think also for the spins and helicities and the masses uh, and, and the distinction between massive and massless particles. In, in other words, we're we're able to show how particles arise um as trivial data structures inside. Um, a headset that, uh, of certain conscious agents. So we'll, we'll show that physics is emergent from consciousness and, and consciousness is not emergent from space, time, and physics. So I'll just thank my, my, um, my colleagues and, and collaborators and I want to leave enough time for some questions because I'm sure this is controversial. So 